Hi, I am Edwina Brown. I work at the Hammersmith Hospital in London and I have a special interest in renal palliative care. And during this talk, I'm going to be talking about end of life and dialysis withdrawal. If you have watched my other talk on prognosis and um, advanced care planning, you will already know this paper. But this is a key paper um, which came out of a KDIGO conference on supportive care in chronic kidney disease. It is an excellent summary of supportive care, um, of how to do things, problems um, encountered, and an excellent list of references. And the recommendations that came out of this meeting was that primary supportive care should be available to all patients with advanced chronic kidney disease throughout their entire course of their illness. That education on supportive care should be recognised as a core competency and therefore an essential component of continuing medical education as well as nephrology curriculum for trainees and that the nephrology community should actively support and participate in research to address knowledge gaps and advocate for policy change. So let's talk about death and dying. Not easy topics, but something that will happen to all of us, us as individuals and to all of our patients. There was an excellent overview in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published by Professor Quill um, and he divided palliative care skills into primary palliative care and specialist palliative care. The primary palliative care skills uh, that were listed by him were basic management of pain and symptoms, basic management of depression and anxiety, and basic discussions about prognosis, goals of treatment, suffering, and resuscitation status. Specialist palliative care um, includes management of refractory pain or other symptoms, management of more complex depression, grief, etc., assistance with conflict resolution regarding goals or method of treatment within families, between staff and families, and among treatment teams, and assistance in addressing cases um, of near, near futility. I would like to suggest that the nephrologist is the primary palliative caregiver for patients with advanced kidney disease. Palliative care should be an integral part of being a nephrologist. A nephrologist should regularly discuss prognosis as part of pre-dialysis care, as part of standard dialysis care, and that nephrologists should regularly attend continuing medical education in palliative care. So the skill sets required for the nephrologist is basic management of pain and symptoms, basic management of depression and anxiety, and the basic discussions about prognosis, goals of treatment, suffering, and resuscitation status. So what is supportive care? Supportive care is the care that helps patients and families to cope with the condition and its treatment from pre-diagnosis through diagnosis and treatment to cure continuing illness or death and into bereavement. It helps patients maximize benefits of treatment and to live as well as possible with effects of disease and it is as important as diagnosis and treatment. Diagrammatically, Supportive care fits into advanced chronic kidney disease management with aggressive treatment being much more um, indicated and of use in the early stages um, of life with advanced chronic kidney disease. And as time progresses, supportive care becomes more and more important and at the end of life is the most important part of management and continues into bereavement. So the tools for achieving the aims of supportive care 
a predominantly communication, communication and communication. Communication with the patient and family, awareness of the patient being at the end of life, advanced care planning and appropriate management of dialysis and discussing withdrawal where appropriate or not starting dialysis at all. Atul Gawande is a surgeon um, at Harvard um, who has written a lot about um, the limitations of modern medicine. And this is an article that he wrote in the New Yorker um, a few years ago. Modern medicine is good at staving off death with aggressive interventions and bad at knowing when to focus instead on improving the days that terminal patients have left. Our medical system is excellent at trying to stave off death with $8,000 a month chemotherapy, $3,000 a day intensive care, $5,000 an hour surgery, but ultimately death comes and no one is good at knowing when to stop. Spending one's final days in an intensive care unit because of terminal illness is for most people a kind of failure. You lie on a ventilator, your every organ shutting down, your mind teetering on delirium and permanently beyond realising that you will never le leave this borrowed fluorescent place. The end comes with no chance for you to have said goodbye or it's okay or I'm sorry or I love you. So in this talk, we're going to talk about the concept of supportive care, recognizing end of life, dialysis withdrawal, and the last few days. So how does supportive care fit in to the different time points in life with advanced kidney disease? So at diagnosis, um, obviously medical care is really important to establish what comorbidities there are, what the symptoms are, what the treatment choices are. Supportive care thinks about the prognosis, identifies patients' concerns and goals, includes shared decision-making for treatment choices, including the option of no dialysis or conservative care and symptom control. During maintenance um, dialysis, medical care again focuses on management of comorbidities, symptoms, dialysis transplant management, and avoidance of complications. Again, supportive care um, consists of giving the prognosis to the patient, identifying concerns and goals, shared decision-making for treatment choices, do they want to change to hemodialysis if peritoneal dialysis fails? Do they want to restart dialysis if their transplant fails? Do they want to have an nth attempt at vascular access, etc.? Symptom control and psychosocial support. I have a detailed conversation around these issues with my patients on dialysis on an annual basis. Whenever there is an acute event, such as a stroke or a fall, a major infection, acute coronary syndrome, medical care is key in terms of diagnosis, investigation and management, antibiotic surgery, etc. But supportive care is also important. It is a time to reassess prognosis. I again identify the patient's concerns and goals shared decision-making for treatment choices of that acute event, including ceilings of care. If their prognosis is, um, is a couple of years, would you be surprised if this patient was dead within the next two years? Do they want to spend six months of that two-year period in hospital, having major surgery and recovering from it, when the outcomes of the surgery may not necessarily be good? Symptom control, psychosocial support. 
And then as the patient becomes more frail and closer to the end of life, again, medical management is looking for um, reversible features, continuing management of dialysis. Supportive care becomes more and more important. Reassessing prognosis, symptom control, shared decision-making around the patient's concerns and goals to determine ceilings of care, place of care, potential treatment withdrawal, and psychosocial support. So how do we recognise the end of life? Part of that is thinking about the prognosis. And in another talk, I have discussed um, prognostic tools. But one of the problems is that in this day and age, many people do not consider death as inevitable. They know it's going to happen, but they hope it's never going to happen to them and certainly not now. This is a um, painting that is in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, and it is called The Three Ages of Woman and Death. Death is inevitable, even for younger people, and we need to think about it. So how do we recognize the end of life? Well, the answer of no to the surprise question, would you be surprised if this patient died in the next 6, 12 months? Prolonged or repeated hospital admissions, deterioration of comorbidities, and increasing frailty, loss of weight, decreasing mobility, requiring more assistance for activities of daily living. So dialysis withdrawal. The K Daigo meeting um, came up with some statements about withdrawal of dialysis. Withdrawal from dialysis is ethically and clinically acceptable after the process of shared decision making. It is incumbent upon all providers caring for patients contemplating stopping dialysis to address potentially remedial factors contributing to the decision such as depression or other symptoms such as pain, as well as potentially reversible social factors. Patients with decision-making capacity who are being fully informed and making voluntary choices refuse dialysis or request that dialysis be discontinued. Patients who no longer possess decision-making capacity who have previously indicated refusal of dialysis whose legal agents or surrogates request that it be discontinued, and patients with irreversible, profound neurological impairment such that they may lack signs of thought, sensation, purposeful behaviour and awareness of self and environment. In all these situations, it is appropriate to withdraw dialysis. But it is absolutely essential to ensure access to appropriate supportive and or hospice care as an integral part of care following that decision to withdraw dialysis. So I'm going to um, show you, um, share with you a patient of mine um, from a few years ago um, who did withdraw from dialysis and how we came to that decision. So this is a lady who started peritoneal dialysis at the age of 70. She had a good quality of life. She was on CAPD five days a week. And she went um, to a boat um, that she shared with her partner on um, weekends. As time went on, her residual kidney function declined. She had to change to APD. She needed a parathyroidectomy. And then she started having memory problems. She needed more help from her partner and the family got concerned. And then she was admitted um, with a major stroke um, and then um, started having some fits and was very confused um, and, uh, and lost consciousness. So if the first discussion um, was held at that time, the family would be completely unaware of a possible stroke and there would have never been any discussions 
about ceilings of care. She would have been transferred to a high dependency unit that had numerous interventions. She may have got discharged, but it is highly unlikely that she would have returned um, to being um, physically independent um, and able to make her own decisions. However, what had actually happened was that we had had a series of conversations over time um, and the family were fully aware of a potential stroke. We had discussed ceilings of care with uh, Mrs M and she had capacity at that time to make decisions. She was clear she did not want to continue treatment if she was no longer independent. So when she was admitted with her major stroke and then subsequent fits, the decision made with the family was for supportive care, symptom control and no investigations. There was no improvement in her state after a week. The dialysis was then discontinued. She went home and she died peacefully at home, surrounded by her family. I would like to suggest that this is a better quality death for the patient and for the family. And it was only enabled by having had the series of conversations with the patient and family prior to the final episode. In a recent survey that was done by the um, European Renal Best Practice Group, um, it was shown that the percentage of people um, in different countries um, who undertook dialysis withdrawal varied depending on the um, perception as to whether stopping life-prolonging treatment was allowed. So this is a bubble plot for each country. The size of the bubble shows the number of people from the country um, who had responded to the questionnaire. So the bigger the bubble, the larger the number of nephrologists who had completed the questionnaire. And uh, at the y-axis is the percentage of respondents um, who um, with, enabled people to withdraw from dialysis and the x-axis is where stopping life prolonging treatment is allowed. So another patient story. This is a 76 year old Asian man who'd been on peritoneal dialysis for three years. He had a background of diabetes, ischemic heart disease, recurrent chest infections, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. He lived with his daughter and um, he now needed assistance with the peritoneal dialysis. He was independent with um, daily activities, but he was much slower walking and had occasional falls and he no longer went out of the house on his own. We had had yearly conversations about his prognosis and he had decided that he did not want heroic management or a lingering death, and he did not want resuscitation. He was then admitted with pulmonary edema, secondary to an acute coronary syndrome. He was transferred to an intensive care unit where he was about to be intubated. The daughter became very anxious about her lack of control of events. We took up the notes from the last planning meeting to the intensive care unit and as a result, he was not intubated and was sent back to the ward next day. Um, a plan was then made by the cardiologists um, for um, a coronary artery bypass graft following um, coronary angiography. And again, um, the advanced care planning notes were highlighted with the cardiology team. It was therefore decided that um, instead of this surgery, he would have um, angioplasty and stenting. This was not successful. He had two further episodes of pulmonary edema and he decided to stop dialysis. He went home and died with his family. So 
So how does one manage the last few days? One knows when these are of stopping dialysis and one should be aware when a patient is approaching um, this time period. So what affects dying? There are a number of things. The culture, religion and ethnicity of the patient, communication, being able to be aware that the patient is in the last few days, symptom control, avoidance of unnecessary treatments and the place of death and the presence of loved ones. Another quote from Atul Gawande from his book, Being Mortal. These days, for most people, death comes only after a long medical struggle with an ultimately unstoppable condition. Advanced cancer, dementia, progressive organ failure, or else just the accumulating debilities of very old age. In all, death is certain, but timing isn't. Technology can sustain our organs until we are well past the point of awareness and coherence. Besides, how do you attend to the thoughts and concerns of the dying when medicine has made it almost impossible to be sure who the dying even are? So what are the symptoms at end of life? Symptoms are common, even in people with dialysis. The painless, uremic death is, um, is not um, an accurate description. The symptoms can be severe. More than 50% of patients on dialysis report pain, commonly from comorbid conditions. They also suffer from dyspnea, edema, nausea, pruritus, weakness. In the last days of life, additional symptoms include myoclonus and pruritus from uremia, edema and dyspnea from fluid overload, pain, muscle soreness and bed sores from immobility and poor <coughs> tissue perfusion. It is therefore important that um, anticipatory prescribing enables the required drugs to be present. Uh, if somebody is at home, um, in many countries um, these drugs are made available um, in the patient's home and in hospital they should be written up as a um, required prescription. And they should include an analgesic, antiemetic, sedative and an anti-secretory agent. But equally important is holistic psychosocial support, which includes communication with the patient and family about what is and what will happen and address their anxieties and concerns. And we should enable the dying person to be with their family and not with medical professionals so that they can pass on their wisdoms, their blessings, and their thoughts. And here are some key references. Thank you.